and then as the cases develop i'll bring up the options in the screen after about 30 seconds so you can then coordinate if what you were kind of thinking yourself was correct with the options on the screen um we'll start off a bit simple but it will be a level up from yesterday and then it will get more complex as we go along okay let's just get straight into it so this was the normal ecg that we saw yesterday we had the system in place where you'd look start off by looking at the patient details uh, calibration rate rhythm axis and then you just go through the ecg systematically okay and i think a lot of you are aware of how to do that uh, just the only caveat we said was that t wave inversion in avr and sometimes v1 is normal so just remember that as we go along and all of the cases that i'm going to show you will be pathological or something will you there'll be an ecg sign so there's no like trick questions so we'll start off quite simply i'll give you guys a minute just to see if you can calculate the rate from this strip here. And we spoke about a couple of ways that you can calculate rate. And I won't bring up any options for this because this should hopefully be quite straightforward from what we spoke about yesterday, but see if you can calculate the rate. And I'll give you guys about 30 seconds. Okay, so if you're looking at this ECG, the way to calculate rate, we said, is to look at the QRS complexes. So let's start with this one, for example. And you've got to calculate or count the number of big squares between the QRS complexes. So in this ECG, we can say we have one, two, and almost three big squares, just a bit less. So between two and three big squares between the QRS complexes. What you do is you do 300 divided by the number of squares. So in this case, it would be 300 divided by just under three or around 2.5. And the rate, we always look for a ballpark figure um, on this ECG would be about 120 beats per minute. And if you look at this ECG, we want to decide if it's sinus rhythm or if it's not. So P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. And we know the definition of a sinus rhythm is if each P wave is followed by a QRS complex. If this was an irregularly irregular ECG, like we saw in AF, you could also use the method of counting the full rhythm strip and then timesing the number of QRSs by six. But you'd need to know if this is well calibrated, yada, 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 so we're not sure with this. So the rate for this was around 110 to 120. That ECG strip showed basic sinus tachy. That's what you'll see as a doctor majority of the time when people show you ECGs in patients that are a bit unwell. Sinus tachy is a sign, is a physiological response. So when your heart rate gets a bit faster, it can be in response to things like exercise. It can be in response to anemia, dehydration, anything that causes your uh, stroke volume of the heart to be low. And in response, your heart responds by increasing its heart rate. Fever, infection, hypoxia, and certain medications can also lead to this. And then you have your endocrine causes like your FIO, where you're producing more adrenaline and your catecholamines. And then hyperthyroidism, where you increase your metabolic rate. And by doing that, you increase your heart rate. So sinus tachy is quite a simple ECG finding that you'll see a lot of the time as a doctor. So it's important to recognize when something is sinus and when something is not. Speaking of which, when you cannot see any P waves and you see this sort of morphology on the ECG, you can classify that as supraventricular tachycardia, otherwise known as SVT. We won't go into the details of the different types of SVTs because that's less preclinical and more later in your clinical years. But just for reference, if you see a patient that is tachycardic and you cannot see P waves on the ECG rhythm strip or anywhere on the ECG, you can consider a differential of an SVT. And just briefly for people who are interested, an SVT there's multiple types, but basically it's where you have this accessory pathway that basically means that instead of your normal in electrical conduction of the heart going from the sinoatrial node to the AVN and then going down and then repeating, you have a re-entrance circuit. So it can go from the sinoatrial node to the AVN. And then as you depolarize the ventricle, there's this little circuit that brings it back to the ventricle and brings it back to the AVN. So you skip the SAN completely 
And that's why you don't have your P waves, because we know P waves are representative of atrial depolarization. And you may miss that when it comes to an SVT. But that's a bit more advanced, and that's just for reference. All you've got to know is if you don't see P waves and the patient's tachycardic and you have narrow complexes, that could be an SVT. Case two. Patient comes in, 58-year-old man with central crushing chest pain, and he has a raised troponin. Can you identify for me which artery has been affected? And I'll give you a minute for this, and I'll bring up the options in about 30 seconds. Okay, see if what you're thinking of can actually be related to anything that's been put on the screen now. I'll give you a bit more time. All right. Hopefully, by looking at this ECG, we, we had a systematic structure of looking at the ECG, right? So if you start off, obviously, patient details and whatnot, you start off by looking at the rate. Doesn't look too bratty or tachycardic. If you count the number of squares between, it won't be below 60 and it won't be above 100. If you look at the rhythm, is it sinus? P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. Yes, it is by definition sinus rhythm. Is it regular? QRS is irregular, and there's no missed QRS complexes, so it seems to be a regular rhythm. Axis. Oh, well, it looks like this is a positive deflection lead V1 and a negative deflection lead, B, uh, lead 3. Looks like they're leaving each other. This could be classified as a left axis deviation, and we'll come talk about that a bit later as well, just for clarification. Looking at this ECG, the main obvious abnormality, which hopefully you guys have seen, is that there's some ST elevation in leads two, three, and AVF. And the astute ones of you may have noticed there's some T wave inversion in AVR, which we know is normal, but there's also some T wave inversion in AVL, okay? And that isn't normal. So that would be called a reciprocal change, okay? And if you've got ST elevation, what we're thinking of is that you have an ST elevation myocardial infarction, a STEMI. And this person has it in the inferior territory, which is supplied by the right coronary artery. So what you're seeing here is basically an inferior MI. And this is what we were just talking about. So since the elevation were in these contiguous leads, and if you remember what we spoke about yesterday, by definition, if there's any changes in two or more contiguous leads, you can then classify that as a pathology that's happening in that territory. So lateral leads are 1, AVL, V5, V6, like we spoke about yesterday, supplied by the circumplex. V1 to V4 are supplied by the left anterior descending artery. And then these inferior leads, one, 2, 3, AVF, are supplied by the right coronary. So you just saw an inferior MI. So let's talk about ACS very briefly. So ACS is ischemia due to coronary artery occlusion. And it's important to remember that it is a big spectrum. So ACS starts with unstable angina. You have stable angina here, which is basically when you get pain, chest pain on exertion and nothing else. That's not ACS. ACS is when you have chest pain at rest. And now you've got to determine how severe the acute coronary syndrome actually is. And this is all one spectrum. Okay, so unstable angina would be when you have chest pain at rest but you have no ECG changes and your troponin is normal. So end stemmies would be also no ECG changes or some signs of ischemia, but no ST elevation and a raised troponin. And then a STEMI is the full shebang. You've got your ST elevation, you've got your raised troponin. So 
specifically looking at the ECGs, when you want to see if there's any ST elevation in any of the leads, by definition, again, if there's more than one small box raised in the limb leads in the ST segment, or more than two small boxes raised in the precordial or the chest leads, so V1 to 6, in more than two contiguous leads, meaning more than two in the same area, that's how you can classify ST elevation myocardial infarction. And to see that on the ECG, like we said, you've got to just check if there's any in the first place. If there is, you're dealing with a STEMI. If there's not, the next step would be to, be to check the troponin. If that is raised, then it's an n STEMI. If it's not raised, then unstable angina. And with an n STEMI, it's worth noting, you may see a, quite a bit of ischemic changes. Okay, um, so you can see some T wave inversion or ST depression but you won't see any ST elevation. And that's why it's called a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. I hope that makes sense. Let's move on to this case and see what you've picked up. So from this, I want you to actually notify uh, or put down what abnormalities do you see? And for a bonus sort of point, what do you think the diagnosis is? So we have a person that's come in with chest pain with a raised troponin. And just for your reference, we do have an old ECG to compare to, and that old ECG showed that there was T wave inversion in lead two. This is the new ECG. What do you think is going on? What are the abnormalities? And what is the diagnosis? Considering of what we just talked about. And there are some options to see if you can correlate what you're thinking with what's on the screen. Okay, so we always look at the ECG systematically. Start off with the rate. Is it tachycardic? Is it bradycardic? One, two, three, four, five squares between them. Doesn't seem too tacky, doesn't seem too brady at all. Normal rate, rhythm, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. It's sinus rhythm. Is it regular? Yeah, looks regular. Axis. Again, we have leads one, positive deflection, leads three, large negative deflection. And if you like AVF, also a negative deflection there. That's left axis deviation. The leads are leaving each other. Looking at it systematically, P waves seem normal morphology, no changes there all over the ECG. PR segment doesn't seem too lengthened. QRS complexes don't seem broadened at all. They seem relatively normal. ST segment, do I see any ST elevation or depression? Not really, to be honest. T waves. Now, we know from their previous ECG that they had T wave inversion in lead two. That might mean that in the past, they might have had a bit of ischemia there, and that's just a remnant that stayed away. That's why it's always important to compare it to old ECGs. But lead one has some new T wave inversion. AVL has some new T wave inversion. These V5 and V6, and, maybe, and even V4 actually looking at it, has some new T wave inversion. That is the lateral territory. So there's some new T wave inversion in the lateral territory. What is T wave inversion? A sign of ischemia. So this patient is having some form of ischemia. So there might be a small clot, not a complete occlusion, a small clot, in the artery that supplies the lateral territory, which is the left circumflex, that's causing some ischemic changes. And they've got chest pain, they have a positive proponent. We can classify this as a potential end stem. And the changes that you see were T wave inversion in the lateral leads and the left axis deviation. 
So this patient's having an NSTEMI. Different between STEMI and NSTEMI in terms of the physical thing that you're seeing, a STEMI is where there's a complete occlusion of that coronary artery, meaning you can't get any oxygen going to that part of the heart. That causes a completely transmural ischemic picture, meaning that whole part of the heart can't get oxygenated and it ends up dying. NSTEMI, you have a partial blockage of the artery, okay, and just to put it basically. So some blood's going through, you can get some oxygenation there, but it's still causing chest pain, you're not getting enough. So it's causing some tissue damage, it's not leading to complete transmural ischemia. So this is what an NSTEMI would look like. And like we spoke about yesterday, in terms of working out the axis, if you look at leads one, there's a positive deflection. So you know it's going to be somewhere here. Leads three, there's a massive negative deflection. So you know it's going to be somewhere here. So you've already isolated that it's going to be in this area here. Okay, so that's basically a left axis deviation. It could be there, but if you spend some time comparing it to the other leads, you'll work out that it's more around here. Okay, and just for the sake of time, because we've got quite a lot to cover, um, I'm going to leave it with that, but do you feel free to look through the slides afterwards and work out the axis from what we talked about yesterday. But that is a left, left axis deviation because one and three are leaving each other. If they were coming towards each other or reaching each other, we'd call it a right axis deviation. Case four, 35 year old man comes in with three days of a fever and some new onset six out of 10 pleuritic chest pain. His troponin is raised, but we've taken two. So the first one we took was 23 when the normal is 14, so it's raised. The second one we've taken is 21 when the normal is 14, so it's still a bit raised. What do you think is going on? What's the diagnosis? Here are the options. Okay, so this ECG, I think some of you are getting this. This is what you're looking at here is widespread ST elevation. Okay, so if you're looking at le these leads, for example, if you look at the ST segment, it's above the baseline. ST segment above the baseline, above the baseline, above, above, above the baseline, above the baseline, and even the inferior leads above the baseline, above the baseline. There's a couple of leads where you don't see it, but in AVR, it's also technically above the baseline because remember, we're looking at the right side of the heart, so it's all flipped over for that lead. Um, two and V1 are the only ones we're thinking, oh, what's happening there? Um, but the majority of the leads, you're seeing wide diffuse ST elevation. When you see wide diffuse ST elevation, you've got to think of two things. Is it acute pericarditis? Or is this person having a huge main stem ST elevation MI? Now, in order to differentiate those things, you've got to look at the history and what the patient's presented with. So we have a young patient here who's come in with what's looking like a viral prodome. They've had a fever, which is not normally what you get with an MI. You usually come with strength, central crushing chest pain, shortness of breath, very sudden onset. This person has six out of 10 pain, which also doesn't really present with an MI sort of pain, which is usually 10 out of 10. Pleuritic, so it's worse when breathing in. And the troponin, although it's raised, troponin is a very sensitive marker. So anything that causes any damage or any irritation to the myocardium or the pericardium, that can result in a bit of a troponin leak. So you, what you do is you take serial troponins. So here we've taken two. One first one was raised very um, a small amount. And the second one is actually falling a bit. So in an MI, what you'd expect is the second troponin to actually rise even more. This one's falling. So what we have here is likely a troponin leak with diffuse ST elevation in a patient who's come in with a viral prodrome. You're right, this is likely acute pericarditis. The pleuritic chest pain is because the myocardium has been inflamed. 
and it's usually caused by something like a virus called Coxsackie virus. You get diffuse ST elevation on the ECG, and the main ways that you can differentiate the ST elevation itself, if you look back at the ECG, this ST elevation, it looks a bit weird, right? It's kind of like a U shape. So this is called concave ST elevation. Okay, in an MI, if we go back to like this one and compare it to this ST elevation, this is a much flatter ST segment. So if you have a real MI, you get flattening of the ST segment and then ST elevation. In pericarditis, you have this concave looking ST elevation and you also can get some PR depression, but that's a bit less of an obvious finding. So that's worth remembering with acute perigarditis. Next case, elderly woman comes in with some palpitations, not on any other medications before. Have a look at this ECG. Tell me what the diagnosis is. the options. And any questions and things, we'll do a Q&A at the end as well. But I think most of you are getting this looking at the chat. So this, as we always do, look at the ECG systematically. Right. Well, well, before even rate, you can kind of just eyeball it and see it's not really that regular rhythm, is it? So we can't do the whole 300 divided by the big QRS complexes. So what we'll do is count the number of total QRS complexes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay, so we know it's already tachycardia, 22 times 632. It beats per minute. So we know this patient's already tachycardic, which is important for a clinical picture and important for this diagnosis as well. Rhythm, we know that it's an irregular rhythm just by looking at the spaces between the QRS complexes. If you look at this one, very wide, very wide, very narrow in the middle, so it's variable rhythm. Is it sinus rhythm, however? Well, not really seeing any P waves. And I know there's always some confusion about, I think someone mentioned earlier about how you can tell if it's a P wave versus a T wave. Well, if you look between the QRS complexes, you want to see if there's multiple bumps. The T wave has a morphology, which is kind of flatter and a bit wider. And a P wave is a bit of sharper and smaller of an actual rise. So if you look at this ECG, you can see some T wave here. That's like a flattened broad wave, okay? But you can't actually see any P waves at all. I mean, can you argue that's a P wave? it's not consistent across the whole lead. So you'd say that's actually a fibrillatory wave. So that's how you differentiate whether something's a P wave or fibrillatory wave. It's got to be present for the whole lead. And if you can't see any P waves, if you've got an irregular rhythm, this is an irregularly irregular rhythm. You already got the diagnosis. This is AF, atrial fibrillation. Probably the most common actual pathological thing that you'll see as a doctor. Um, sinus tachy you'll see all the time could be physiological. Fast AF or H AF with a rapid ventricular response is one of the most common emergencies you'll see as an F1. So it's important to manage um, and investigate further. So AF is caused by a sudden flickering of the atria. So if you see here, normally we know that your atria start off with sending an electrical conduction signal from the SAN to the AVN. In AF, your SAN is not always involved straight away, which is why you don't get the P waves. You just get sudden um, rises of electrical potential coming from random parts of the atria. And that leads to this flickering motion and that flickering um, contraction, meaning that you don't actually get a full atrial contraction, which is why it's dangerous. It's also dangerous because of this sudden flickering it increases your chances of flicking a clot all the way to your brain and causing an ischemic stroke. So treating AF, you have to anticoagulate 
and you have to try and control the rate and the rhythm. Okay, we won't talk about management due to time constraints, but if anyone's interested, those are the ways that you manage AF. And you have acute fast AF, which is what we see with this lady, that you've got to kind of rate control and manage the causes. So causes can be ischemic heart disease, heart failure, valvular disease, infection, drugs, electrolyte abnormalities, basically anything. So anything can cause AF, especially in the elderly, because your heart gets a bit weaker and a bit more sensitive. So anything that causes any irritation or any problems with the heart can result in your atria going a bit crazy and causing you to have a picture of AF. So to manage acute AF, you've got to manage it acutely there with some rate control. Some people, in the eld uh, especially the elderly population, have something called paroxysmal AF, which usually resolves within seven days by definition, but that needs a pill and to manage that. Um, or you can have permanent AF. So some people you'll see in hospital just have normal AF at a rate of between 60 to 100, not tachycardic. They just live their normal life. The only thing you need for that is anticoagulation. And then you just monitor the patient just for reference. But in order to actually, what we want from this session is to see if we can recognize how to, what AF looks like. And the way you see it is no P waves and an irregularly irregular rhythm. Just for reference, some people get confused with what atrial flutter is. Atrial flutter is very similar to AF, but your atria are actually fully contracting. And you have an atrial rate, which is basically counting the number of big squares between the P waves of 300. By definition, your atrial rate in atrial flutter is 300 beats per minute. And because of that, you get this really obvious sawtooth baseline, which you don't get in AF. So AF, you have these sort of weird like fibrillatory little waves here, no obvious P waves. In atrial flutter, you have this very obvious sawtooth abnormality baseline. And you'd also still have an irregularly irregular rhythm because not really sinus, because not every P wave is followed by a QRS. And if you look at the differences between the P waves, it's not a regular rhythm. Next case, 78 year old man with CKD is admitted into hospital following a feeling weak and sick and just feeling a bit rubbish generally. Since he has CKD, he's on dialysis and he missed his session over the weekend. We've done an ECG and this is what it shows. What do you think is going on? What is the abnormality and what is the diagnosis? options. Excellent. I think a lot of this, this is very well taught, I think. So again, looking at the ECG, is it sinus rhythm? Yep. You've got P waves. Is it regular? Yep. QRSs are all normal. Um, any axis deviation? Not really. What's the main abnormality here? Well, if you look at the QRS complexes and compare them with these massive T waves here, you've actually got humongous T waves that are very narrow, very pointed. These are called your tall tented T waves, which I think everyone knows about. And they're a bit broad, but they're, sorry, they're a bit narrow and they're very pointed at the top. That's what tenting looks like. And that is a classic sign of hyperkalemia. So tented T waves happen in every single lead. If you have one lead or two leads that you're like, oh, is this a tall T wave or not? It's probably not hyperkalemia unless it's happening in every lead. So even AVR here, we're looking, it's quite a large T wave, even though it's upside down. And you compare it to the QRS complex. So here you're thinking, oh, it's not actually that big, but neither is a QRS complex. So it's really difficult to comment. So hyperkalemia, the, this case actually, the patient missed his dialysis session. One of the indications for dialysis is electrolyte abnormality. So his electrolytes basically went off because he didn't get his blood replaced with the dialysis. So hyperkalemia is when your potassium is above 5.5. When it hits above six, you start worrying about ECG changes. And it's a really nice way to remember it actually is in the order of the changes that you actually see. You start off by seeing tall tented T waves. So you have this little box here. You start off by seeing tall tented T waves. Then your PR segment gets a bit longer. Then you get flattening of the P waves, 
and then you get a broad QRS. And then that eventually forms this sine wave. And that's when a patient's in cardiac arrest. Okay, because you have no cardiac output at all. You won't be able to feel a pulse when it gets to this. And why is this important? Because, or why is potassium important in the first place? Well, the T wave we know is ventricular repolarization. Potassium is important in order to get your ventricles to repolarize. So if you've got too much, it can lead to abnormalities here and it can be very difficult to manage. So just remember this sort of nice box. You remember it starts off by being tall T waves, long PR, flattened P waves, broad QRS, and then you get your sine wave. So that's your hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia would be the opposite. And you'd actually get things called U waves as well, which you can see in hypocalcemia, but those are less common and you'd be severely hypokalemic to see a lot of ECG changes. Hyperkalemia is much more examinable, examinable and much more common that you see changes like this in hospital. Case seven, 50 year old woman presents with syncope. So she's blacked out. She has a strong history of ischemic heart disease. Have a look at this ECG. I'll give you a bit more time for this one. What do you think is the diagnosis? Bearing in mind that the patient's presented with syncope. So something's up with, just to give you a clue, she has a strong history of ischemic heart disease. Something's up with the heart, to make, which basically means she's not getting enough cerebral perfusion of oxygen which is why she's fainted. And I think I'll give you the options for this one. So if we start by looking systematically, rate, again, a bit weird, seems a bit, the rhythm doesn't seem right. So let's calculate the rate by counting the QRSs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So about 72, nothing crazy ventricular rate, normal. Rhythm, well, the rhythm, you see QRS, QRS, QRS. I think there's one that's meant to be here, really, but you don't really see it. QRS, 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 QRS. But is it sinus? Well, there are P waves. See a P wave there? This big, broad thing's the T wave, then the small, little, sharper thing's the P wave. P wave's present, followed by QRS. P wave present, not followed by a QRS. So it's not into sinus rhythm anymore. You've lost a QRS. But if you're actually looking at it systematically, and axis isn't too exciting, if you're looking at it systematically, P waves present with normal morphology every time. PR interval doesn't seem bad. It's getting a bit longer, getting a bit longer, even longer. There is no PR interval here because you've lost your QRS complex. So you've dropped a beat, a ventricular beat after the QRS. So what type of heart block causes you to have a long lengthening PR interval with a drop beat? Second degree Mobitz type one. And we'll talk about this, how to remember it. Okay, so this is number two, second degree Mobitz type one, otherwise known as wanky buck. And the way you remember that's Mobitz type one is, I call it like wonky buck. It's a really stupid way to remember it, but if it helps, then it helps. So this lady had some heart block and let's talk about what heart block is. So heart block, there's three degrees. First degree heart block is basically where you have a lengthened PR segment or PR interval, I should say. And what we spoke about before, the PR interval is basically where your electrical conduction is kind of chilling and waiting in the AVN to then go down. So if there's any problems in the conduction between the atria and the ventricles or the SAN and the AVN, I should say, then it can cause your PR interval to lengthen. First degree, you've just got a consistent but prolonged PR interval. 
as you see here. You're not dropping any beats, you've just got a long PR interval. That's sometimes natural, can be caused by some problems. Some people live with that their whole life, not deep, not a big deal. Second degree Mobitz 1, which is one key back, which is the Mobitz 1, which we just saw. If there's any intermittent problems with the conduction between the a SAN and the AVN, it can lead your PR interval to lengthen. And then what happens in second degree heart block is then suddenly you drop a beat. Something there causes your electrical potential to not be conducted between the, a the SAN and the AVN. And that's why you drop your beat. So you have lengthening, lengthening, lengthening of your PR interval. And then suddenly you miss a beat. And that's what you see in type one. Type one is also not too dangerous. Some people can, we just monitor it really. It doesn't really require much intervention. And a lot of people kind of jump between first degree and second degree type one. It's not that big a deal. Now, second degree type two Mobits, that's where you have regular P waves and a fixed PR interval, but then you drop a beat. So with Wenke back, you have long lengthening, lengthening, lengthening PR, and then a drop beat. Mobits two, you have the same fixed PR interval and then a drop beat. This is all like one cycle, by the way. So this is getting worse and worse. So what happens here is that before we had sort of something that's affecting the electrical conduction, that could be ischemic event, that could be a PE, that could be infection, that could be drugs. It could be a bunch of things, loads of things. The heart's very sensitive, can affect the electrical conduction of the heart. Second degree, you're actually fine initially. The, you're getting a normal conduction. I mean, it's kind of not ideal because you still have a lengthened PR but it's a fixed PR interval, okay? So nothing's actually affecting conduction. Then what happens, you randomly drop a beat. Something then has an impact on the conduction and makes your AVN not conduct any of the potential energy you're getting from the SAN. And that leads you to drop a beat. Mobitz 2 is dangerous. The reason Mobitz 2 is dangerous is because it's very likely, or not likely, it's more common for it to then develop into Mobitz 3, uh, into third degree heart block. And what is third degree heart block? Third degree heart block is where there's no connection between the atria and the ventricles at all. So here, the blockage is between the two nodes, the SAN and the AVN. Here, there's no connection between any of the atria and the ventricles. So your heart is now making these things called junctional beats, which are basically beats that originate from somewhere in the ventricle, completely unrelated to the atria. So what's happening is your atria are running at the same pace that they normally would, but that is completely unrelated to the QRS complexes and your ventricular rate. So if you count these individually, they're regular, but if you compare them to each other, they're completely unrelated. And that's third degree heart block. These two things, second degree Mobitz two and third degree require pacemakers, okay? And they're very dangerous and that could lead to further syncope. Hope that clarifies heart block a bit. And just for sake of time, we'll move on. But at the end, there's a bit, a few more ECGs that we can look at with that as well. So case eight, 60 year old man with central crushing chest pain, awaiting a trot, no previous ECG. Have a look at this ECG. I'll give you a bit of time. What do you reckon is happening? What's the diagnosis? There are your options. Okay, again, systematically. P waves present? Yep. Regular? Sinus rhythm? 
yeah axis deviation one and three are leaving each other there's some left, left axis deviation p waves okay pr interval looks okay the main thing here which i think a lot of you have noticed is that your qrs is looking quite broad so if you look at previous ecgs that we looked at or we'll come on to it actually if you look at normal ecgs the qrs complex is very narrow it's kind of like just one line here right these are looking very very broad for a qrs complex whenever you see broad qrs's something is affecting the conduction that's resulting in impaired ventricular contraction you got to go straight to thinking about things like bundle branch blocks so this is a left bundle branch block and i'll explain shortly what that means and how you can recognize it so first thing to recognize this is what a normal qrs kind of looks like quite narrow quite sharp this is kind of blunted this is what a broad qrs would look like okay and it's kind of a morphology that you've got to just recognize and see if you understand it it looks kind of wide and this is narrow so this is normal this is broad so if you understand that you're already halfway there so what is a bundle branch block as we know you have your sinoatrial node and then your AVN. And we spoke yesterday, you have your bundle of His that goes into your left bundle branch that splits into two, but we are ignoring that for now. And then your right bundle branch. Okay. A bundle branch block is when you have a blockage of impaired or impaired conduction into one of these stems of their bundle branches. Okay. On your ECG, the typical thing people say to remember it is that you see a W in V1 for a left bundle branch and an M in V6, and for right bundle branch, it's the opposite. You see an M in V1 and a W in V6. So you always look at V1 and V6 for bundle branch blocks, because as we know, V1 is the closest chest lead to the right side of the heart, and then V6 is the closest chest lead to the left side of the heart. And so it gives you a good vision. This acronym people use William Morrow in the sense of W for left bundle branch and then M for in the V6, and then in V1, you get an M and the, for right bundle branch, and then in V6, you get a W. So some people like to use that acronym to remember it. But you don't always see this really obvious W and M. So what I want to do is kind of explain firstly why it happens, and then you'll be able to understand and recognize when it's not quite an obvious pattern. So say we have right bundle branch block. Your conduction can't get through to this side of the ventricle. So what happens? you end up having all your conduction from the AVN going down your left bundle branch. And then in order to get your right ventricle to contract, because you still need to contract your right ventricle to get the blood going, the cardiac myocytes actually then take the electrical potential and the electricity and the energy, and they start contracting themselves a bit slower. So let's say our V1 electrode is sitting there. What happens is that your electrical potential goes here all the way down the left bundle and then it goes through the cardiac myocytes which are a bit slower and not as fast as this whole bundle of his Purkinje system and then the cardiac myocytes eventually cause the right ventricle to contract so you get asynchronous contraction between the ventricles as well that correlates to this in v1 because if you think about it first you've got everything going to the left bundle and we know the first thing that happens is intraventricular, interventricular septal depolarization, which causes an R wave in V1 because it's going towards the right of the heart. And then you get a bit of an S wave because everything on the left side is getting depolarized, which is away from V1, so you get this bit. And then you get this slow, but you do get your electrical potential then going towards V1, and then you get this large R wave that you see in V1. So that's why you get that M shape and that RSR complex in V1 in right bundle. I want you to remember the RSR is the main thing. The other one, you kind of, it's just the opposite. You kind of compare, but the RSR is the classic morphological thing that you look for. If we compare that to the left bundle branch, nothing can get through to the left side. So what happens instead of your septum getting depolarized from the left, it all goes from the right. So everything goes down here to the, for the right so you'd get a bit of an r wave it's not that obvious here but you get a bit of an r wave because it's going towards v1 and then once it gets to here your cardiac myocytes take over and get depolarized and then all your energy and electricity is going away from v1 
So then you get this deep S wave because we know if anything's going away from a lead, then you get a negative deflection, which is your S wave, which by definition is the first negative deflection after your R wave. I hope that makes a bit of sense. And you just get the opposite in the other leads if you go through it like this. The main things to look for is your RSR, this M thing, and see if it's in V1 or V6. If it's in V1, you know it's right bundle. If it's in V6, it's left bundle. And then for the opposite lead, in terms of if you're looking at right bundle, if you've got a S wave in V6, it's right bundle. If you've got a big S wave in, L, in V1, then it's left bundle. I hope that kind of clarifies it, but we'll have some more examples a bit later on as well. Um, but it's quite a difficult concept to grasp. There's loads of really like good videos to watch on YouTube as well, just for reference. But I hope that kind of clarifies why you get a broad QRS, because instead of your Purkinje system taking over, you have cardiac myocytes that are getting depolarized, and that takes a lot longer than um, your actual bundle of his in the Purkinje system, which is why you get a broad QRS. That's the main thing. If you see a broad QRS, bundle branch. Next case. Woman, sudden onset shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain. What's the diagnosis? There are your options. So again, systematically, P waves present. Yep. What is, sorry, uh, what's the rate? Um, so the rate is not looking too bratty or tacky if you count uh, between them, nothing crazy there. Rate rhythm, P waves present followed by QRS is yep. Um, sinus rhythm, regular, yep. Axis, oh, one is, has a massive S wave, negative deflection. Three has a large R wave. They're reaching each other. You have some right axis deviation here. Okay, and that's the first thing to know. We have some right axis. P, P waves look all right. PR interval doesn't look lengthened or anything. QRS complex. We just spoke about bundle branches. I thought we were done with those. Well, I think some of you may have noticed. This is the RSR thing that I was just talking about. And it's in V1. What does that mean? This is right bundle branch. You have a broad QRS. So as soon as you see a broad QRS anywhere, you go straight to V1 and have a look. What's it look like? Does it have a big S wave or does it have an RSR complex? This has an RSR complex. Okay, thinking right bundle, let's just confirm that by going to V6. V6, does it have an RSR or does it have a big S wave? Oh, it has the R and then big S wave here. So we've got a right bundle branch block that we're dealing with here. So, so far we've got a right axis deviation and we've got our right bundle branch block. Okay, what else are we thinking of? ST segment doesn't look too exciting. T waves, you've got some inversion. V1 we know is normal, but we've got some in the anterior leads. Just for reference, right bundle branch can usually also present with T wave inversion. It's a sign of right heart strain. So those are probably related. So we'll keep that in the back of our mind. And you always got to relate it to the clinical picture. One extra thing I want to mention with this CCG Look at leads one. So we know it's got a big S wave. What's up with lead three? You don't usually get that larger Q wave. That is a large Q wave. If it's more than 25% of the whole QRS complex, you classify it as a pathological Q wave. A sign of previous ischemia or a sign of what this could uh, be. So you've got your Q wave and you've also got your inverted T wave here. This sign is called S1 Q3 T3 and is a classic examinable sign of someone who's had a pulmonary embolus. And it only happens about 10 to 20% of patients, but examiners love it. So just remember the sign. Classic ECG changes in a PE. Oh, so this patient came with sudden, if I told you someone came with sudden onset shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain, your head would go straight to PE anyway. 
but just for reference, ECG changes, the commonest thing you see is sinus tachy. Then the other things you see are right axis deviation, right bundle branch, and then this S1, T3, T3 thing in that order of how common. Okay. PEs are quite difficult in reality. As an F1, I've kind of witnessed, they're quite difficult to actually diagnose because the patient doesn't, it depends on how big it is. Like the patient might not even be that short of breath. They might just have an ongoing oxygen requirement, but they've come in for other reasons or whatnot. And the ECG is quite a nifty tool to see if they've actually got other risk factors for PE in terms of if they're showing these signs in order for you to diagnose getting that D-dimer, getting that CTPA. So these are worth remembering. Next case. What's the diagnosis? Patients come in basically in cardiac arrest. You see this ECG. Consultant hands it to you. What's the diagnosis? There are your options. I think many of you may get this just because it's, it's got quite an obvious morphology. So usually we talk about things very systematically. When you get something like this, I mean, the first thing that you notice is that, wow, all I'm seeing is these broad QRS complexes. They're regular, to be fair. They look the same in each of the leads, like they're not changing. And then when you get more advanced, you can notice you have the P waves here and you actually have complete heart block dissociation as well with this arrhythmia. This is ventricular tachycardia. If you have regular broad complex QRS complexes and tachycardia, your mind has to jump straight to VT. And this patient is, has no pulse. So this is pulseless VT. And it's one of the things in the cardiac arrest algorithm that you have to consider. Um, this patient has post as VT. Now what's happened next? They develop this rhythm. What's this? Same options as before. So a patient that's gone from pulseless VT, who's having a cardiac arrest, I never mentioned if we managed to resuscitate him or anything like that, his ECG is now turned to this. All you're seeing here is again, they're just squiggles to be honest, if I'm just being blunt about it, they're just squiggles, they're just random. You can't really tell, like, look at this one, where that comes from? Why is it like going like this? You have broad QRSs throughout, but can you even classify them as QRSs? I don't know, you've just seen a squiggly line um, this is the classic morphology you'd see in ventricular fibrillation. Not torsades de point, we'll come on to that shortly. This is ventricular fibrillation, basically an unreadable ECG. This is also part of the cardiac arrest algorithm. So these patients are really, really unwell and need management straight away. Briefly, if you see anyone with a tachyarrhythmia, so anyone who's tachycardic over 100, the first thing I want you to do is check the QRSs. If it's a narrow QRS, and it's regular, then you already know it's either sinus tachy or SVT. And how do we differentiate between those two? If the patient has P waves. So if they're sinus tachy, they'll have P waves. If they've got an SVT, they won't have P waves, okay? If they're a narrow QRS, but they have an irregular rhythm, AF, you're in fast AF. We've got to anticoagulate and we've got a rate control. QRSs are broad. Broad QRSs are dangerous. We're thinking of our bundle branches, but this person's also tachycardic. Tachycardic with a broad QRS, are they regular? Do they have normal, regular, not normal, but do they have regular morphology? That's the same, that's consistent, VT. Irregular, random squiggly lines we're thinking of, VF. Okay. Now, I know it's saying six, we started slightly late, so I've got a couple more ECGs, just a quick fire if you guys want to stick around. We're going to just go through this. I won't have any options. But I just want to see what you guys think, and we'll talk through them briefly, okay? This is all going through what we've learned. We've learned 90% of what your common pathologies you'll see as an F1 will be. So let's just go through these ECGs before we finish off.
What's the diagnosis, spot diagnosis? Excellent. I think most of you are getting this. You're looking straight. I hope you're all looking at it systematically. You're looking at the rate rhythm axis. Rate-wise, if you count this, you'll find the patient's a bit tachycardic. If you're looking at the rhythm, oh, well, it's irregularly irregular, isn't it? Where are the P waves? These little things, again, they're more obvious. You can clearly see they're like fibrillatory waves as opposed to an obvious T wave and an obvious P wave. So that's fibrillatory. You can properly see it here, actually. So this is your fast AF, your AF with a rapid ventricular response. Good. Diagnosis. I'm seeing a lot of STEMI, but give me a location. Give me a territory. Okay. Systematically, you go through it. P waves, fine. Rhythm, sinus, um, regular. Left axis deviation, leaving. Main abnormality you could see. Look at these. That is some clear flattening of the ST segment we spoke about, which is a niche finding no one tells you about in med school, but very important to diagnose MIs. Large ST elevation in V1 all the way to V6, actually. So if it's just an anterior STEMI, you'd expect it to kind of stop at V4. What you've got here is an anterolateral STEMI. You've got V5, V6 ST elevation. If you look here, subtle ST of elevation in AVL very subtle ST elevation in lead one. So you've got ST elevation in the lateral leads as well as the anterior leads. So this is an anterolateral STEMI, okay? The astute ones of you may have noticed there's some reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads here, very slight, okay? So this is a sign of an anterolateral STEMI. Very dangerous, this patient needs to go to the cath lab straight away. Diagnosis. And just for reference for the previous, um, sorry, let me just go back to this one for a second. Um, in terms of the actual artery affected here, left circumflex would be your lateral leads and your left anterior descending would be your anterior leads. So if they're both affected, you probably have a proximal occlusion in the left main stem before you've even gone to those, the split of those two arteries, just for your reference. Sorry, back to this, what's the diagnosis? Always look at the ECG systematically. Good. Some of you are getting this and some of you may take a bit of time, but heart blocks are very hard to get and it takes a bit of time to learn it. This is first degree heart block systematically. Rhythms, fine. Sinus rhythm. This does count as sinus rhythm, by the way, because technically you have P waves. You're not dropping a QRS. QRS is are followed. Uh, P waves are followed by QRS every single time. So this is sinus rhythm. This is sinus rhythm with first degree heart block. You have a lengthened PR interval, constantly lengthened no dropped beats. Okay, so this person is a first degree heart block, probably normal variant. If not, then you just monitor and wait, nothing too exciting. Diagnosis here, we've just got three more. 
the CCG is quite, has, I put it in because of one diagnosis and then after having some time to look at it, there's actually a couple and you can properly work out what, why the patient's shown this clinical picture. Okay, it's a difficult ECG. Have a look at the P waves and have a look at the PRS complexes. Excellent, some of you are getting it now. This does show complete heart block. So P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave that's hidden in, in the T wave here, P wave, P wave, P wave that's hidden here, P wave, P wave. The P waves are normal in terms of their rhythm. QRS, 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 QRX also has a normal regular rhythm. But are they related to each other? No, completely not. Sometimes the P wave's hiding in the T wave. Sometimes it's hiding in the QRS complex. Look at this one, it's just hiding there. The P waves and QRS complex are unrelated. Now I just Googled third degree heart block and put this in. Then after spending some time looking at it, I've actually found out this patient, I don't think anyone's put this. Did anyone notice that there's some ST elevation going on in the inferior leads? And you've got some reciprocal ST depression in AVL and the lateral leads. So unfortunately, you all missed a STEMI as well. So basically, this patient, just from the ECG, we can automatically tell the, I think one person did mention it in the chat, the inferior leads are supplied by the right coronary, right? So if you have complete occlusion of the right coronary artery, you have an inferior MI, yes? The right coronary also supplies the right atrium in terms of the nodes, so the SAN and the AVN, so especially the AVN here. So if you've got complete occlusion of the right coronary artery, you get your MI, but you can also get complete heart block or any problems with the electrical conduction of the heart. That's quite a good nugget to know. So if you have problems with the left coronary arteries, you get really bad ischemia and it's actually really difficult to, to send this patient to the cath lab and fix it. Very dangerous patient could die from that. If you get occlusion of the right coronary, also bad because you get an inferior MI, but the main concern is the complications of a right coronary occlusion are fatal arrhythmias. And that could be something like this complete heart block. People were talking about bundle branches because you see the broadened QRS, excellent. Bundle branches, if you think about it, is when you have a blockage of one pathway of those bundle branches, they can present themselves with complete heart block as well because complete heart block, you've got no association between the atria and ventricles. On top of that, if you've got a complete occlusion of one of the arteries that's supplying one of the bundle branches, you can get that as well. So loads of signs in this ECG, and you've already kind of got a whole clinical picture just from, just from this 12 lead ECG from the viewpoint of the heart. It's really amazing. Last two ECGs, guys. What's the diagnosis here? Seeing a lot of VTs, excellent. Any specific, anyone can be more specific, which I guess now I've said is kind of giving it away. Yeah, excellent. So this is torsades. Um, torsades is polymorphic VT. So if we look at this ECG, if we look at one of these leads, let's look at this one, right? Something weird's happening there, I don't really care. But what happens here is that you get these broad, regular QRS complexes that are going in a spiraling pattern, which is very typical of torsades. Okay, it's getting smaller here, but it's still regular, still broad, still regular, getting wider here. And then you have this ventricular ectopic beat, which is advanced, but this is what a ventricular ectopic looks like. And that basically converts this rhythm back to um, what it was before, which is still looks a bit odd, but not in torsades anymore. Torsades management, you give magnesium sulfate, but it is basically a form of VT. So you guys are right. Just recognize that it's polymorphic. Okay. 
last ECG, and it's a difficult one. Let's see who gets the overall diagnosis. There's signs here, but can anyone spot the overall diagnosis? And it's a bit mean because it's a bit difficult without a clinical picture, but I'll give you a history in a second after seeing the responses. It's not something that we haven't done. Always look at ECG systematically. And then add up the signs and you may be able to get a diagnosis. Okay, if we look at it systematically, it's not something like six sinus syndrome or things that we haven't talked about. It is something we've talked about. If we look at it systematically, okay, rate, tachycardic, is it sinus? Well, it's difficult to see P waves, but arguably those are P waves and they are quite regular to be fair. So as soon as you see P waves anywhere in a normal lead, then that counts as sinus. So this is sinus rhythm. Any deviation of the axis? Marked deviation, right axis deviation. The leads are reaching each other. PR segment, don't really care, not that exciting in this ECG. QRS complexes, very broad. When we see broad QRSs, where do we look to straight away? V1. Okay, broad QRS, what am I seeing in here? Is it a big S wave or is it RSR? Looks like an RSR pattern thinking right bundle branch. Can we go to V6 to confirm if there's a big S wave? There's a huge S wave in V6. Confirmed right bundle branch block. So we've got right axis deaviation, confirmed right bundle branch block. One other thing to think, and sinus tachycardia, by the way, it's probably really obvious now. Let's just check if we've got that special sign. You've got S1, Q3, um, they aren't really large Q waves, but you can argue there's a Q wave there. But you have T-wave inversion, so maybe you've got S1, Q3, T3. This is a patient that presented with a massive pulmonary saddle embolus on CTPA. And this was their ECG, and they have all the classic signs. So this patient did have a PE. Difficult ECG, but just like any ECG that you look at, if you look through it systematically, and then just pick up the signs, and then add them all together, add it to the clinical picture, add it to the other investigations, then you're able to diagnose what the condition is. And thank you very much for listening. That completes both my sessions. I hope they were useful. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or happy to get emails about them. Um, just please fill out the feedback. I'd really appreciate that. So thank you very much. I'll pass it back on to the BMO committee. Thank you so much, guys, for attending the event. It would be greatly appreciated if you guys could fill in the QR form, no, fill in the feedback form. Sorry, I just have one question. Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, you know, like the ST elevation thing, I don't know, I get confused with it sometimes, like to like identify like when it's actually elevated. Is it, is it just like when it's sort of like higher on the thing? Because I always thought that it was like, you know, when it's like sloped a bit, I thought that like classed as ST elevation, but... Um, yeah, no, it's a good question because it is difficult and there's certain conditions that cause something that looks like elevation but isn't elevation. So ST elevation by definition 
you check where the J point is, which is basically where your T wave starts, okay? And compare that with the isoelectric baseline of where the PR segment was before, okay? If you've got elevation more than one millimeter in the limb leads or more than two millimeters in the chest leads, you have ST elevation. Whether it's pathological ST elevation is based on your clinical picture and based on what previous ECGs look like as well. So you always compare it to old ECGs. So like there's a condition called benign early repolarization, which basically causes this like, it looks like ST elevation, but it's just a bit of a early takeoff that a lot of people get confused with. Conditions like that pop up, but especially for medical school, just remember if you've got a flattening of the ST segment, and if you've got ST elevation, then we're worried about MIs. Okay, thank you. Happy to take any other questions if there are in the chat as well. I'll just have a quick skim through. The answer to the last case was a PE. Um, I had a question actually. I was wondering like what yeah. exactly is the um, active deviation? So what, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Sorry, uh, I said, what exactly is axis deviation? Like when you say there's left axis deviation and right, I understand the leaving, the reaching bit, but like, what does it mean to the patient? Like, is it a fault of the patient? Is it a fault in the chest leads? I haven't quite understood that. No, so it's not a fault in anything apart from it's any deviation or what axis is, is the complete overall electrical potential and the direction of the, that electrical potential. Okay, so the normal axis is between minus 30 and 90 degrees. If your total electrical potential in the heart is going in that direction, you have a normal axis. Different things can affect your axis. So anything that causes impaired electrical conduction to the ventricles can cause axis deviation, meaning the main vector for where that electrical component's going can be shifted left and right. So it's not like positional. Um, it can be in terms of how the heart's physically positioned, but the main things that cause axis deviation are things that cause impairment in the electrical conduction of the heart. It's clinically relevant because if you have axis deviation, it could be a sign of an underlying ischemia, an underlying pulmonary embolus, um, anything else that has caused irritation to the heart's conduction system. Heart blocks can lead to axis deviation. And if you Google it on uh, life in the fast lane or anything like that, a bunch of things cause axis deviation. And it's actually a really important clinical sign to spot. Some people have access deviation and it's not a big deal. So you've always, as with everything in the ECG, put it on to the whole clinical picture, if that makes sense. Hey, Danielle, I think there are a few questions over here that yeah. I sure copied in. So there's one that's asking what you mean by contiguous leads. So contiguous leads, we spoke a bit about yesterday, but for those who missed it, basically mean leads that are formed in the same territory. So contiguous leads, for the inferior territory would be two, three, and AVF. Contiguous leads in the lateral territory, one, AVL, uh, V5, V6, and the anterior territory would be V1 to V4. Those are contiguous leads, meaning if you've got changes in those leads, in those territories, if you've got two or more changes, then you can diagnose things like MI, but you basically kind of got to look in each territory to find out where the problem is, and so you can isolate the problem. And that's what contiguous leads means, basically. Yeah. There's also a question here that asks, how do you differentiate between AF and atrial flutter? So atrial flutter, you'll have a, on ECG, you'll have a clear sawtooth baseline, which you won't have on AF. And AF, you can't calculate an atrial rate, which is basically you calculate by looking at the P wave. So AF, you can't see P waves. So you physically can't calculate that rate. In atrial flutter, those sawtooth baseline is made of all those P waves and the rate would be 300. Yeah. And is the PR interval normal in MOBITS2? The PR interval is length in MOBITS2 is lengthened. It is lengthened. And then you get a drop beat, usually. Rarely is it ever normal and then you get a drop beat. So it is lengthened, but it's consistently lengthened. It's not getting longer. And there's just two questions here on the chat box. There's one that's asking, why is new onset OBB sign of MI, but not RBBB? Yeah. Because new onset left bundle branch, as we were spoken about before, just from what arteries supply these parts of the heart, 
So the left bundle branch is supplied by the left main stem. So if you've got a new onset left bundle branch block, then you're likely looking at something that's affecting the left main stem in terms of an occlusion, probably an MI. Right bundle branch is supplied by the inferior, by the right coronary artery, but it's got so many other causes. Right bundle branch is very common. Like in, as an F1, you end up being really good at diagnosing right bundle branch because it has a bunch of different causes. So it could be a sign that the patient's had an ischemic event, but it's not very specific. Whereas new onset left bundle branch, very rare to just get that isolated. The only time that would really happen is if the patient's had an MI. And if there is a left axis deviation, does that mean there is a problem with the left side of the heart? If there's a left axis deviation, there's a problem with one of the fascicles. So this is getting a bit advanced. If there's a left axis deviation, there's a problem with the, um, there's an impaired conduction on the right side of the heart. So if, you, if we go a bit more advanced, the left bundle branch has an anterior and a posterior fascicle. If you've got blockage of one of those fascicles, you get different axis deviations and you get left axis deviation if you've got blockage of the anterior fascicle. And if you Google it, there's quite good videos of it. I don't want to go into too much detail because it's a bit complex but it shows that there's problem with that impaired conduction. Any deviation, you know there's impaired conduction. As a student, I always thought it was because the heart moved and things, but it's not. It's just because you've got some impaired conduction going from the atria to the ventricles, and that leads to movement of the main vector of electrical current. And just here, the last question is, what is the difference between VTAC and VFib? Is it that VTAC just looks more regular? On an ECG, Yes, so VTAC would be broad, regular complexes with the QRS, and VFib is just random squiggly lines, like you can't really read it. In real life, VFib is worse than VTAC because VTAC can lead to VFib. And if you think about them anatomically and what you're actually looking at, VTAC you're, is tachycardia because the ventricles are constantly pumping, right? Like really, really fast. VFib, the ventricles aren't even pumping now. So you've got no cardiac output at all. You've just got like fibrillatory ventricles, like you have an AF, except that happens in the atria. So VF, you've literally, it's as if your heart's basically stopped beating. You've got no cardiac output, so it's more dangerous. They're both dangerous, but one leads on to the other.